but these days Shetland is switching to heavier carcass crossbred sheep which can't survive on the rough hill grazing. And for the first time all the dubious benefits of modern grassland management, artificial fertilizers and weed killers are beginning to arrive on the islands. Roan is a Shetland word for nowadays it's called shearing but rowing is plucking the wool off the sheep. Usually they tie the sheep's feet two feet and two feet. They tied them together with a rope. And then you just sat down with the sheep, or not, lay on your knees with the sheep on the ground, and you plucked the wool off. And you see, the new fleece rises, and the, oh, it, it pushes up the old fleece, and there's a, a visible se separation when you look at them. You can see there's a separation. When you pull that wool, the old fleece pulls off, and it leaves the new one. Some sheep, it would be much tougher than others. And therefore, if you had sheep that the wool was clinging very firmly to and they were very tough, you'd, and you had to row a whole day, you'd find it's probably painful on the sheep, but it's painful on the fingers too, because you'd get your fingers clustered by evening. But anyway, uh, nowadays there's not many folks doing that. They're mostly all using either sheep shears or else uh, electric shears. Sheep is, uh, is more or less taking over everything. There's no cultivation now, there's no cattle, as I said, there are very few. When I was younger, or, or just after the Second World War, there was not nearly so many sheep in here, nothing like it. Most of the sheep were out in the hill, and you might have had very few in here, but this was mostly all for cattle and, and, uh, and cultivation for crop. Once, the only real source of aggravation between sheep farms and birds were the great skewers, the notorious and piratical bonkses. Not so much because they occasionally attack sickly lambs, but because they mug the sheepdogs. But Shetland's 5,000 pairs of bonkses represent more than half the population in the Northern Hemisphere. There were no bonkses on moss at the turn of the century, and no gannets, and no former petrels. And now, you know, you've got all these thousands of them. Even in my time, they've built up from about 250 to 400 pairs of bonkses on, on the islands. We had a dog before that actually got driven into the sea by the bonkses uh, diving on her, which made it very difficult to gather sheep. But um, the other dogs like Peg take a more aggressive attitude, and when they get dive bombed, they just jump up and chase them off. We have learnt to live with the bonkses. I mean, it's the way we manage the sheep, I think, in that we have to take them in by at the lambing time. Um, so that the lambs don't get taken by the boxes. But um, other than that, once the lambs are big enough, we don't actually have much of a problem. Once they're big enough, they, they move out amongst the boxer colonies and um, they don't get taken by the boxes. Certainly, you know, Bobsy boxes will pick up any dead lamb, but they will, in some circumstances, attack sheep live, and, and uh, that has been well authenticated. I do think, too, that an awful lot of fat. They feel a bit bad when they find a lamb gone with hypothermia and they say it's the damn bonksy. When it's really hypothermia and the bonksy is just being scavenger. So maybe they get a, a worse press than they deserve, but only just, mind you, because when there's a lot of bonksies, it's like humans. If you put them in a high density, then you get unmitted sort of gangs that form, and they are the ones that get up to the devilment. Certainly we never expected to see the oil terminal when I was a young boy, but uh, uh, it's, uh, it sort of just fits into the place and no, we never see it. <laughs> well, they've tried very hard, but we had to learn. I mean, you know, within months of, of the terminal opening, we had um, a serious oil spill in the harbour, the Asopanissia spill, which um, was dreadful, but we all learnt a lot from it. I mean, it killed a lot of sheep and it killed a lot of birds. The very, very little pollution so far now for several years, it's been very clean. I mean, otters live around the terminal, live around the, uh, the wharfs and all that sort of thing. They found that they were actually living in the stonework around the jetties over there, right in the terminal there. They pay no attention. In fact, they've got a sign up on the road saying otters crossing. 
beware so the motorists coming in and they yes, so they're living all around the town quite quite at home. I think the thing is that we see Sullenvo now as, as part of us, our lives in Shetland, and we don't just talk about the oil companies, we actually, we, we feel in control of it to a large extent ourselves, and if we mess it up, it's going to be our fault. Well, oil has certainly changed things, to know about that. Uh, it's given the, the local authority more money than they'd ever had before, and by and large, the, they've used that money very wisely. It's made more jobs. I mean, oil has been good. It's provided a range of, of technical jobs that were badly needed in Shetland. Um, and so that a lot of the university graduates and technically qualified Shetlanders have been able to work in Shetland if that's what they wanted to do, and that, that's been great. I mean, obviously it created social change fairly rapidly, but it was change that was going to happen anyhow. At one time, you know, when you went to do your shopping in Commercial Street, if you met a stranger, it was news. But when the oil began to come here, <laughs> if you met somebody you knew it was news. <laughs> no, it was an awful upheaval, but things are beginning to settle down now. I mean, when the oil boom came, and at one point there were about 50% of the children in the high school were new to Shetland. And people started talking about the Shetland way of life and the Shetland dialect um, disappearing, and the opposite happened. Fifty years ago, if you wanted to insult a Shetlander, you called him a Scotsman. He didn't like to be called that. <laughs> but now that's all gone. We don't pay any attention now. We've got English, Scotch, Irish, Welsh, all living around. Nobody pays any attention as long as he's a good neighbour, he's all right. Some people are very proud to say that they're Scottish and others that they're mostly Norse. Personally speaking, I feel that I really must have quite a few roots that go back into Scotland. And uh, I just like to think I'm a Shetlander. <laughs> I, I'm not Scottish. Uh, I'm Shetland. Uh, I live uh, right the other side of the Tartan Curtain, way up north of the Tartan Curtain. Uh, I have nothing. That's not meaning that I have anything against Scotsmen. I just am not white. It's the same as calling a, 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 a Welshman English. You're liable to get a, a first full of Welsh knuckles if you're dead. But uh, that, that is, it's, it's not putting on the style, it's a historical fact. I'm just not Scottish. I don't blow bagpipes nor wear kilts or anything, even Scottish culture, we have a, a different culture, we have a one. Shetlanders' roots are Norse as much as Scottish. They come from strong communities, wise in the use of the sea, and haven't been vulgarised by their newfound wealth. Their handling of the impact of oil on their lives and on the local ecology has been a lesson we can all learn from. Let's hope that Shetland's furious scales have indeed dispersed the worst of the spills, and that a more insidious legacy is not lying on the ocean floor, waiting like a creature from Norse mythology to exact its revenge. <laughs>